Hey, I'm Hank Patterson, author, activist, dream weaver. Every once in a while, I get an idea for a franchise that I don't have the rights to. And I'm like, damn, well, what can I do then? Hank, I say to myself, you can tell people. So now, my dear friends, I'm telling you. This is a gritty reboot for a beloved 1980s children's toy. We'd shoot live action and go for a hard R rating. So I should warn you now, there is graphic violence ahead and a lot of cursing. Come on, let me tell you the story of my <clears throat> Mad Balls movie. You remember the Mad Balls, right? Little toy balls with real ugly faces. They had a couple of different continuities, one from a cartoon and another from a Marvel comic book series that I actively collected as a kid. But anyway, forget everything you thought you knew about Mad Balls, because this is something totally new. That's right. These ain't your daddy's balls. So, fade in on. A school field. Gray grass. Gray clouds above. Everything looks bland, depressing. It's like it's being cast out of sorrowful cement. On the field, a misfit student, Billy, 12 years old, is collecting up a bunch of fist-sized red rubber balls and putting them into a net. With Billy is Lyle, a haggard old gym coach. Billy wonders about some balls at the far end of the field, but Lyle explains that those are the irregular balls. He says that the school buys cheap knockoff athletic equipment, and sometimes you get balls that ain't right. He says to just throw them in the gutter. The rain will wash them away. So that's what Billy does, and that's exactly what happens. We follow the eight irregular balls, malformed, floating in the gutter, the rain washing them down the hill and into a larger creek. But the creek isn't full of water. It's full of a noxious, bubbling, dark green liquid. We pan up and see that this creek is being contaminated by chemicals coming out of a large industrial building that sits alone on a big gravel lot, like a medieval castle. This is the Nuclear Energy Research Department Laboratory. Nerd Labs. In the creek, the thickness of the ooze causes the balls to move slower and slower until they're just bobbing on the surface of the ooze. Then we pan up and head over to the Nerd Labs. Rain patters on the windows. The inside of the lab is a dirty place full of bizarre science equipment. Bubbling chemicals, machines throwing off giant sparks, and lots of technical tools. There's a small nuclear reactor in the corner of the lab, and it's crapping out the green waste that's polluting the creek outside. Working in the laboratory is Victor von Frankenschmuck and his assistant, Chris. Victor is tall and grandiose, and kind of weird looking. Chris is short, with a slightly oversized head and a tendency to simper around their boss. Chris has very little hair and does not appear to be male or female. We pan in on Victor's current experiment. There's a dead raccoon in a large transparent box. The box has no top. Victor is mixing a bunch of weird bubbling chemicals together and then he dumps them onto the dead raccoon. A big cloud of multicolored smoke rises up off the corpse and then the dead raccoon begins to twitch. Though still clearly quite dead, the raccoon rises up on all fours and then up onto its hind legs. It can almost reach the top of the box, but not quite and the raccoon begins to growl angrily. Victor is thrilled. He's laughing. But then, the raccoon's skin begins to turn green and bubble, its body swelling. The raccoon is getting angrier. Victor frowns and checks his notes. 
The raccoon lets out a dreadful scream and Victor opens up his lab coat, reaching for a small handgun he wears in a shoulder holster. But before Victor can even take out his weapon, the raccoon's body bursts in an explosion of green goo mixed with red chunks of gore. Victor pounds the counter with his fist and curses. Chris jumps fearfully when their employer shouts. For a moment, it looks like Victor might fly into a rage, but then his shoulders simply sag with resigned disappointment. It's just another failure. Victor tells Chris to dump it with the rest of the garbage, so Chris pours the red-green goo out of the box and into a dirty old bucket. Then we follow Chris as they haul the bucket outside and dump it into the toxic creek. Then they step back from the creek about 10 feet. Chris pauses. They look around suspiciously. From one pocket, they pull a small piece of machinery it has a label on it, but the writing is strange, with unrecognizable characters. Chris flips the device open, showing it looks almost like an old cell phone, but still oddly different. Chris seems to dial a code into the device and then begins to speak into it. Their voices oddly clipped and professional now. There's a sound on the other end of the line. It could be static or a language we can't quite identify. Chris says that the time has come to begin the experiment. Chris tells whoever is on the other end that they should strike now. Then Chris closes the phone and puts it away. Chris looks at their watch, clearly waiting on something, and we see five minutes go by as they stand there. Everything is quiet. And then suddenly, as if from way up high in the atmosphere, a big purple strike of lightning comes shooting down at the earth, exploding into the toxic creek. Chris goes flying backwards, and then they get up and see the purple lightning still crackling in the green toxic ooze. Chris giggles hideously. A ways down the creek where the balls are floating, the green purple ooze begins to bubble into a thick froth, and the balls sink into the ooze. And then... From out of the strange, toxic creek, not far from where Chris is standing, the balls come bursting back out, now changed, now alive, now... The Mad Balls. They fly through the air and then bounce down onto the ground. They're confused disoriented, rolling around on the ground for now, though later we'll see them flying and bobbing in the air. They're blinking and coming into awareness. Chris gasps. They can't believe what they're seeing. They rush back to the lab to get their boss. Once Victor sees what they are, he's shocked by the mad balls. He quickly gives the order for Chris to help him gather them all up, and the mad balls just sit there, blinking and drooling. Now back inside the nerd labs, Victor and Chris get the mad balls into a grid of metal cages stacked against a wall. The mad balls are getting more active now, making weird little babbling sounds, like babies. Chris notes that they seem to be growing agitated, and Victor suggests that perhaps they crave stimulation. He has Chris wheel in a large metal cart with three televisions on it. Chris plugs them all into one power bar and then turns the bar on. The three television sets all come crackling to life, each on a different show. The Mad Balls all quickly become enraptured by the televisions. They all focus on the screens, absorbing everything they can see and hear. Commercials, shows, all of it. Then we have a montage of the day going by. The Mad Balls watch TV and start to laugh and seem more interested and aware. Victor takes swabs off all the balls and tests the samples, trying to figure out exactly what the Mad Balls are. Eventually, day becomes night, and Victor and Chris shut the lab down and head home. The televisions stay on, and the Mad Balls stay up all night watching weird TV. An old Something movie. Something we don't understand. Some late night ads. It's unheard of. And then, at around 4 a.m., 
the power bar sparks out, and the three televisions go dead. The mad balls stare at the blank screens for a while, and then the mad balls begin to speak. Just babbling obscenities and jokes at first, but one of the mad balls, Crackhead, seems a bit more confused by his own existence than the others. He wonders aloud what they are and why they're alive. Another of the balls responds, Well, we sure as fuck ain't the Smurfs. Most of the mad balls don't really care about what they might be, though, and they decide to go do something else. Now look, there's eight mad balls, all with their own voices and personalities, but I'm not going to slow this thing down to identify which one is speaking unless it's important to the plot, which for the most part it's not. The mad balls mostly individualize themselves through their actions, though obviously if this were a movie, we'd have a cast of great voice actors to help set them all apart. We're dealing with a classic team of the original eight mad balls. Screaming Mimi, the baseball, is the self-appointed leader of the group. Crackhead is the smart one who questions all that they're doing. And yes, I know that Crackhead's name was originally changed to Bash Brains, but since this is an adult treatment, I thought we'd use it as an excuse to bring back the classic moniker. Hornhead is the aggressive Cyclops. Oculus Orbis is the big eyeball who is the most curious. Slobulus is the green zombie that drips mucus on everything. He seems sweet. Skullface is sort of the group goth, quiet and spooky. Dustbrain is the mummy head. They believe themselves to be very wise, but are not. Arg is the blue zombie head, and he's just along for the ride, baby. A lot of his lines will be stuff like, oh yeah, and oh yeah. And just for the record, if I had anything to do with the casting, four of the balls would be played by male actors and four by female, or women actors, I, I guess is what we call them, I don't know. Screaming Mimi, Crackhead, Arg, and Slobulus would be the males. Hornhead, Dustbrain, Skullface, and Oculus Orbis would be female. And at the same time, that's just casting. I'm not saying the balls are male or female. They're sci-fi magic talking spheres. They don't have genders, okay? Back to the story. So first, the Mad Balls chew and smash their ways out of their cages. Then Hornhead crashes through a window, and the rest of the balls follow him out into the night. Now they're outside. They're still a little confused, but they clearly share a strange bond. They also seem a little angry, or at least very destructive. They come up with names or name each other while still giggling and telling dumb jokes. And then Oculus Orbis hears something, and then all the others are listening as well. From off in the distance, we can hear an angry man's voice. An angry man is telling someone they're gross. They're a disgusting freak. The balls start to roll in that direction, and the camera zooms on ahead of them, moving down the street. As we travel along, we can see that we're in a bad part of town. Burnt out cars and smashed TVs on the street. And just inside an alley, a gang of middle-class thugs are threatening a young punk. This is Alex, a 19-year-old agendered street punk. Short spiky hair, a big leather jacket, clearly homeless as well. The thugs are polo shirt wearing white guys in their early 20s. The gang all has ultra conservative haircuts and khaki pants. Their leader is George. The other five are Tim, Tom, Kenny, Steve, and Barry. The thugs are aggressively menacing Alex. They have Alex surrounded, and they start touching Alex, shoving and pawing. They're calling Alex a weirdo, saying they're disgusting, but there's a weird sexual component to it. It feels like a real bad physical assault is about to take place, and the thugs even say as much, laughing about the impending gang rape. But then, BAM! A baseball hits George in the back of the head. He yelps, and then turns around angrily. George looks to see who threw it, but there's nobody there. Just a baseball on the ground. George picks up the baseball. There's something weird about it, though. He brings it up to look closely at it, and it's screaming Mimi. The ball lets out a horrible laugh and then bites off one of George's fingers. 
George screams and drops the ball. The ball keeps giggling and chews on the finger, slowly eating it. So now all the mad balls show up and violently take out the thugs, killing them one by one. This is where we see just how modern and adult these mad balls are, as each executes a thug in a signature style. Oculus Orbis stares at Steve, and Oculus begins to pulse, a strange rhythm traveling through his veins. He hypnotizes Steve, and tells the guy to tear his own dick off. Then we cut back to Oculus, laughing as we hear Steve screaming, and see a splatter of blood fly up against the wall next to Oculus. Almost as though Steve had just torn his own dick off. Dustbrain wraps their bandages around Barry's throat. Barry tries to run away and strangles to death. Arg and Crackhead both strike Tim and Tom's heads together with such force that Tim and Tom's heads crush into each other, their skulls caving in brain tissue coming out their ears and noses. Skullface rams Kenny in the stomach. Kenny groans and falls down, and once he's on the ground, Slobulus hovers over him and starts gagging and snotting ooze into Kenny's face. It's an impossible amount, quickly filling Kenny's mouth and nose and gagging him until he chokes into unconsciousness and death. Now the only one who's left is the leader, George. He's got his back to the wall, watching it all happen, horrified as he holds his bleeding hand. Screaming Mimi pops up in front of George's face and asks George if he thinks it's funny to jam yourself into people's bodies without getting permission first. George is confused, and then Hornhead comes flying in at high speed. George screams as Hornhead dips down and then flies up into George's ass, exploding out through George's abdomen, bursting George's entrails out across the alley. The Mad Balls laugh horribly. Alex is disgusted by the violence but also relieved to be saved. The Mad Balls, like an old school public service announcement, explain that it's wrong for anybody to try and hurt you or touch you in a way you don't like. And that if somebody doesn't like you because of how you look, then fuck them. Alex wonders what the Mad Balls are, and aren't they afraid of being arrested for murdering all those guys? And the Mad Balls are like, Yo, man, we don't give a fuck. We're fucking mad balls, yo. We don't give a fuck about your rules or your laws or nothing. Alex says they're going to get out of there and head home. The mad balls say goodbye and then begin to wonder if they might also have a home. Back in the nerd labs, Victor and Chris are looking at the broken cages. Victor is aghast. Chris is rather impressed. Victor runs off to get his coat, and as he does, Chris takes out his small device and speaks into it again. We follow Victor and Chris as they ramble through the town in a big white Nerd Labs van, hassling old homeless people and other strangers. But eventually, they hear the sounds of the Mad Balls. In the midst of a busted-ass old city park, the Mad Balls are enjoying themselves on a decrepit playground, mostly destroying everything. All the park goers are terrified and keeping their distance, but one little boy seems entranced by the balls. This is Billy, the dumb little kid from the first scene. Billy watches as the Mad Balls argue and play. Slobulus vomits a bunch of goo onto the slide, and a bunch of the Mad Balls go down it like it's a water slide, splashing the slippery snot everywhere. It's fucking revolting. Eventually, Billy approaches the Mad Balls, and it's a very touching scene, a bit like E.T., where Billy politely tells the Mad Balls how neat they are, and he asks if he can be their friend. The Mad Balls say they don't really give a fuck and go on being gross, but now Billy is playing with them, running around and laughing like a fucking idiot. This is when Victor and Chris pull up in their van. Victor reaches out to the Mad Balls and calls them his children and says they need to return with him. And the Mad Balls tell him to eat shit and say they'll never go back to living in cages. Victor shouts that he is their father and demands that they obey him. And Screamin' Mimi shouts back that he should 
fuck off! And the shout is so loud that it knocks Victor over and leaves him dazed. So Chris has to take him back to the lab. But now Crackhead is pissed at screaming Mimi because Crackhead feels that Victor could have helped the Mad Balls to understand what they are. Screaming Mimi, on the other hand, thinks Victor is an asshole and they don't need nothing from nobody. Crackhead wonders, don't you want to know what we are? Why we exist? But Screamin' Mimi doesn't think the truth is worth it if it means they have to take orders from some piece of shit. The two start yelling at each other and soon all the mad balls are yelling at each other, though it basically amounts to a lot of fuck yous. The shouting gets more and more intense until at last one of the balls, probably Hornhead, says, you know what, fuck this, and he just takes off. Suddenly, all the mad balls realize they can just take off and they all say fuck it and bounce literally. Eventually just leaving Screaming Mimi all alone with Billy. Quietly, Screaming Mimi says sadly to himself, man, fuck you guys. Back at the (coughs) back at the nerd labs, Victor is poring over some notes while Chris putters in the background. Victor can tell it's the ooze that's doing it. It has to be. They go in balls and they come out freaks and Victor figures that means he can use it to create life. Chris wonders if anything that crazy could ever be controlled, and Victor muses that he should use something more reliable than dumb rubber balls. Smash cut to Victor in a dollar store, buying a big bag of 500 green plastic army men. Smash cut to the toxic creek. Victor drops toy soldiers into the ooze, and six-inch-tall super soldiers come marching out. They've got oversized teeth and bulging eyes. They look like they're jacked up on steroids, tiny bodies thick with muscles, and battle-crazed looks on their faces. Victor's using lab equipment to scan the soldiers as they come out. Victor remarks that it's clearly not just the chemical runoff, it's something else. A wisdom is guiding these transformations. He just can't see what it is. At first, the crazed looking soldiers are as confused as the newborn mad balls, but the soldiers adjust to their new existence much quicker. At first, identifying each other with knowing glances and then gathering together in several well-ordered lines on the gravel lot outside the nerd labs. Victor is thrilled with his new army, but as soon as he attempts to give them orders, everything falls apart. Quickly, the soldiers turn on Victor and Chris, and despite their diminutive size, the soldiers overpower their creators and take them prisoner. Left to their own devices, the soldiers take over the nerd labs and start breaking down Victor's equipment. Once the soldiers have a bunch of component pieces, they begin building a strange new machine. It looks almost like a complex laser cannon. And once constructed, the machine shoots a blue beam of energy that bursts through the roof of the labs and goes on up into the sky. It's crazy, like nothing you've ever seen before, except for those other 50 movies that did the exact Same thing. Victor wonders what the device is, and with gleeful tears in their eyes, Chris says that it's the end of the world. Victor is confused by that, but largely ignores it. Around the city, the Mad Balls have all gone their separate ways, but when the big blue beam fires up into the sky, they all see it, and almost instinctively, they start heading towards it. Eventually all the Mad Balls, still being followed by Billy, wind up together as a group again outside of the nerd labs. The Mad Balls all eye each other suspiciously, uncertain if they can work together as a team. But eventually they realize that they have to put aside their differences and help. Why do we have to save the world? Cause we're the only ones who can. And this shit just got real.
The Mad Balls head over to the Nerd Labs, and now there's a giant fucking action scene as the Mad Balls have to take out 500 hardcore army soldiers. It's brutal. The soldiers are small enough that some of the Mad Balls, like Screamin' Mimi and Hornhead, can bite the soldiers' heads off or tear off their limbs. But all the Mad Balls still use their signature styles while Billy stands on the sidelines cheering for his heroes, the Mad Balls. It's a big, crazy action set piece, maybe 20 minutes of pure chaos. But the army soldiers are clearly outclassed by the Mad Balls. The soldiers bleed too and scream as they die. It's like the opening to Saving Private Ryan, but a thousand times bigger. And instead of it being Americans versus Nazis, these are crazy super soldiers fighting against giant grotesque balls that have crazy powers. Oculus hypnotizes soldiers into killing each other. Dust Brain wraps them up and crushes them with mummy bandages. Slobulous snort barfs goo all over the men, drowning them in snot as thick as tar. Screaming Mimi, Hornhead, and Skullface mostly eat soldiers, while Arg and Crackhead work at destroying the big blue laser, eventually unplugging it and then smashing it to bits. As the last of the soldiers are defeated, the big blue beam collapses with the sound of an imploding fart. Victor and Chris get loose in the carnage and look to be sneaking out when Billy catches them by the back door. Billy doesn't really understand what's going on, but based on TV shows he's seen, he assumes that the evil scientist is probably the mastermind behind everything. Billy jumps in front of the exit door, preventing Victor from leaving, and Billy mocks Victor, shouting, We did it! We beat you! And that's when Victor takes out his small handgun and shoots Billy in the stomach. Chris is mildly surprised, but uses that moment to sneak out while Victor is still preoccupied with being annoyed at Billy. Billy's bleeding out, dying on the floor, as Victor takes aim again, now pointing the gun at Billy's face. Victor asks him, any last words? And Billy, blood dripping from his mouth, looks up at Victor and says, Eat my balls. The Mad Balls fly into the shot, and one by one at a terrifying speed, they fly into Victor's mouth, breaking his jaw open and smashing out all his teeth. We see the outlines of all the Mad Balls as they travel through Victor's digestive system and come exploding out his ass. It looks incredibly painful and is clearly fatal. Once all the Mad Balls have run through him, Victor shudders for a few moments, puking and shitting blood, and then falls to the floor, dead. The Mad Balls, covered in blood, let out a cheer. Now let's get the fuck out of this place. What about the kid? asks Slobulus. The Mad Balls look over at Billy, who manages to raise a thumbs up to the Mad Balls. Billy smiles through the pain and then dies. I honestly have no idea who the fuck that kid was, says Screaming Mimi. Holy shit, says Crackhead, noting that the dismantled laser cannon is starting to smoke and spark. I think this thing's gonna blow. The Mad Balls all go flying out of the building like it's exploding. They land outside and roll for cover, but the building doesn't explode. Huh, says Crackhead. I thought for sure it was gonna explode. The Mad Balls start talking amongst themselves, and then a few moments later, Nerd Labs explodes with a mighty blast of energy, destroying the building. Epilogue The Mad Balls, together as a group, look out over the city and think about their future. We don't really know why we're here or what we are, but the answers must be out there, somewhere. And then we fade to black and cut to Chris hiding down an alley and talking into that weird device again. Chris is saying, 
You know I can't speak our language when I'm in this body. But tell the High Commander. We have the weapons we were looking for, and the trial run would suggest they're far more powerful than we'd ever hoped. I'll send the data now. We see that Chris is sending all the information on the Mad Balls. And then, we fade over to the other end of the call. We see a big screen, and Chris is on it, along with all the information about the Mad Balls that's being sent over. And then we pull back away from the screen, and we see that the room is full of- Oh damn! It's the aliens from Mars Attacks! Is this movie part of a larger Mad Balls vs. Mars Attacks cinematic universe? Holy shit, son. It might just be. Hard cut to black and roll credits in great big fucking letters written by Hank fucking Patterson. So yeah, that's it. That's my pitch for an R-rated live-action Mad Balls movie that could possibly lead into a Mad Balls vs. Mars Attacks sequel. I figured we could also get the Garbage Pail Kids in there at some point, but I didn't want to rush things. Anyway, obviously this movie isn't ever going to get made, but I had a lot of fun writing it, and hopefully you enjoyed listening to it. I've been Hank, and you've been listening to the Death by Media Man podcast show thing, I guess. Leave a like, and don't forget to share and subscribe. And if you feel like I earned it, drop a little something in the tip jar. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And and please don't sue me, whoever owns the Mad Balls. Please don't sue me. This was this was just for fun. It was a parody. It's a joke. You can't you can't sue me. Prank caller. Prank caller. I'm hanging up. We're sorry. The number you have dialed is not in service at this time.